you know, what, what you can do about it. I think that's the biggest thing and what to look for with heartburn, what you, not only what you want to do, but what you should pay attention to and what you should, uh, should avoid when you need medical intervention. And when you don't, I think these are extremely important, important things. A lot of people suffer and, uh, I see it all too often. And in, in my clinic, um, when I see somebody is suffering from heartburn on, uh, on my intake paperwork, that's one of the first places I go because there's just so much, so much involved in it. And there's so many consequences. So it's a kind of a, um, kind of a, a very, a very high level concern that needs to be addressed right away. So, um, I'm going to share my screen with you so we can, we can get started. Um, so a little bit, a uh, little bit of my background. I always like to start. Everybody deserves to know who the speaker is and where they're coming from and where their biases are. Um, I'm, I practice natural medicine. Uh, my background, my background is really in in chiropractic, but I don't, I don't practice chiropractic anymore. Um, I refer all of that out. Um, my doctorate's in chiropractic, but my postgraduate education and certifications are in multiple fields of functional medicine, functional endocrinology, uh, functional immunology, um, uh, functional neurology. So really what functional medicine is, if you haven't heard of functional medicine before, it's, it's really just a blend of advanced diagnostic testing and natural medicine. So there's lots of, um, lots of ways uh, functional integrative or functional diagnostic medicine can go. But when it comes to heartburn, acid reflux, all of these things, um, functional integrative medicine, looking for the root cause of the problem versus just masking it with you know, supplementation or masking it with medication is, is really maybe one of the first and, and, and safest places to go. Because um, if you mask the symptom with whatever strategy, there can be, there can be significant consequences in, in something like acid reflux and heartburn um, is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the original problems. So I'm, I'm going to get into all of that here today, but that's, that's my background. Um, so the, some of the points I, I find when I do these presentations, uh, hitting a topic this big, I don't do anything. And if anybody is watching this, that has worked with me, I don't do anything just a little bit. Everything has to be extremely comprehensive. So I have a hard time to talk about something as big as this topic in literally 40 ish minutes. Um, but I'm going to do my best and hopefully I don't sound like an auctioneer as we're going through this. So a little disclaimer, if I do, and you have questions, I did, uh, I'm probably not going to have time to answer any chats or any questions during this. Cause it's just me and it'll, it'll, uh, interrupt my thought process and, and create a hesitation for everybody else. That's, that's not asking questions. So feel free to reach out to me at the, at the email address and I'll, I'll announce that at the end. Um, if there is any clarity, I'll do my best to get back to you. So some of the points we're going to talk about here today is what is heartburn, acid reflux, GERD, also known as GERD, and um, indigestion. Okay, that's one piece. Um, are you suffering from acid reflux? So people need to know uh, what to look for when it comes to acid reflux. Uh, are they a candidate of it? Some of these symptoms are bizarre. And it's, if, I'm imagining you're going to find it interesting of what uh, what some of these symptoms are. It's not only burning and how prevalent is it? You know, are we at risk? And why is this topic so important? Well, I highlighted that a little bit at the start of why this topic is so important, but I'll get deeper into it. And the primary causes of heartburn um, and the four secondary causes of heartburn. Actually, there's a little bit of a trick in there. There's going to be a little bit more than four. Uh, and what you can do, so natural solutions and strategies, as much as I can give, everybody's case is different, but you'll understand that. And then I'm going to introduce some, uh, some free information at the end, some more free information. So what is heartburn, acid reflux, and uh, GERD, and uh, indigestion? Well, these are all really synonym, synonyms of one another. Heartburn is really a symptom. It's not a diagnosis by no means. Indigestion is a symptom. But acid reflux, also known as gastroesophageal reflux, is a disorder. It is a disease. It is a diagnosis. And it's something that should be determined if, if someone's symptoms are that severe. Um, patients are commonly told their symptoms are the result of an overproduction of acid. And I want to debunk this right at the start. This is maybe one of the biggest mistakes in medicine, creating this story. It's just not accurate. The research says it. It's not just Dr. Harrison. Uh, and talking about the research or making research. Um, 
Are you suffering from acid reflux? Well, um, these are some things you should look for. And there's a lot of symptoms, by the way. Uh, common symptoms, chest burning and aching. Be careful with this. If you have this, don't just assume it is acid reflux or heartburn. Go to your primary. It can mimic a lot of times early onset, you know, uh, heart, heart attacks. You know, a lot of people go to emergency and they find out it was, it, was, it was an episode of heartburn. But don't assume this. This is serious stuff. Okay. So make sure if you have that, you know, go in. Don't wait. Um, and, but a lot of times with heartburn, the symptoms will get worse or acid reflux. It'll get worse when you lay down. And this is because when you lay down the acid in your stomach starts to crawl up your esophagus. And then that's where, that's where people experience it more commonly when they lay down or they say when they go to bed at night, bloating after meals can be a common symptom of acid reflux. And intolerance to spicy foods, citrus, coffee, and other acidic-based foods. So they used to be able to handle them. Now they can't. That can be a, that can be another another symptom. Um, and less common symptoms: belching. Belching. This is a, this is an interesting one. But yes, if it's consistent, it can be associated with acid reflux. Hiccuping. This is another thing. Constant hip hiccups can be associated with this. And feeling gassy. And I'll, I'll try to explain how these symptoms are what they are and the reasoning behind them in, in the time we allow today. Also craving ice, believe it, not ice in your drink, but actually wanting to chew it. This is a common symptom. I shouldn't say, well, I've seen it quite a bit in clinics. So I guess it must be somewhat common. A common symptom of, of iron deficiencies. This is a pretty severe iron deficiency if you always like to chew on ice. And I've had clients like this and it would really frustrate their significant others always chewing on ice and we get annoyed with it literally years. And then we find out that they were iron deficient. Iron deficiency is closely tied with acid reflux and heartburn because um, just because we'll get into that uh, low stomach acid can or low or acid reflux is associated with low iron, but I'll, I'll get into that. And low iron, a common symptom of that is craving ice. Little kids will actually try to and want to eat dirt. They're trying to pull iron out of the dirt. They don't, they don't know dirt is bad when they're little, when they're a baby. Uh, past diagnoses of H. pylori. This is a little bacterium. We'll talk a little bit about H. pylori. We can't talk about acid, acid reflux and, and acid problems of the stomach if we don't talk about H. pylori. So they're all tangled up. And anemia, mostly iron deficiency anemia, sometimes B12 anemia. I'll get into how anemias play into acid reflux. Okay. So uh, those are some really diverse symptoms, I would say. Now, how prevalent is acid, uh, heartburn and acid reflux? It is high. Right now, more than 60 million Americans suffer from heartburn more than one time per month. And, and serious heartburn, not just mild indigestion. More than 15 million Americans suffer from heartburn every day. And I'm going to get into why this is so important here. But this is, again, this is a statistic right from the American College of Gastroenterology. These are the, these, these are the stats. Okay. So why is it so important? Well, this is a big one. I, um, but heartburn symptoms are really an indication of another serious problem that will lead to long-term consequences. It not, not that it might or it could, it will lead to it. It is a ticking time bomb. It might be a little bit uncomfortable and then it gets really painful. And by the time it gets really painful, there's serious consequences. There's serious health outcomes. They're not just going to, the hole is dug and now you're going to have a lot more work to try to get out of it. And hopefully you can get out of it. Um, that's why this topic here today is so important. Um, and few people know about these long-term consequences. So I want to shed light on it. Um, so if you or your family or friends or anybody that you know is suffering from it, at least you can give them some information. So the primary cause of heartburn, there is one primary cause. And I had a hard time to actually break this down because there's so many things, but the primary cause. The primary cause of heartburn, many people have been told is not enough stomach, or, or sorry, too much stomach acid. Um, their stomach is overproducing stomach acid. No, nope, it's actually the opposite. And I still don't know why that's being said. I think it's being said because it's an 
it's a simple concept for patients to wrap their head around and they don't know all this stuff. So they're like, well, I have a lot of stomach burning sensations. Um, the doctor, it, it probably, I guess more acid would cause this problem. And then the doctor gives me an antacid or Prilosec or some form of medication that shuts down stomach acid. And oh my goodness, it works so good. So must be too much stomach acid. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's more complicated than that. And I'm going to get into that. So the primary cause of heartburn, it's never too much acid ever, ever, ever. I've never seen it in my life. And I don't, I've never even came across research in that. That's actually journals that say it's, it's too much. It's never, that's a bold statement to say anything about health, something absolute, but I'm going to say it today. It's either not enough stomach acid or number two, not enough stomach acid, <laughs> or number three, acid in the wrong place. Okay. I'm going to get into all of these. So why do we need stomach acid? Well, you know, stomach acid does quite a bit for us. Um, it keeps the door closed. So if you look at this beautiful little picture that I didn't draw, um, you have your stomach up here, you have your esophagus, and then there's this little door this sphincter, it's this closed sphincter in this picture. And on the right, the sphincter is open. On the right is showing a problem. This blue fluid is stomach acid, and this acid is starting to crawl up the esophagus. And that's where the problem, that little refluxing, that's where those symptoms start to uh, are created. It's from the esophagus, even though it can feel in other places. And this door, when it opens, acid climbs up but you have to have enough stomach acid to keep the door closed. This, this, this little door is called the lower esophageal sphincter, LES, and it works off an acid switch. So when acid comes down, acid gets too low, the door opens. And, and then there's still stomach acid in there that is, that is painful to the esophagus. So then when you lay down, the stop, gravity's not holding it down. So the acid has a chance to climb up more so when we're laying down, but it can be any time. So it's actually lack of stomach acid, not too much, but the door is opening. There's a few things to create low stomach acid to create this door to open. Okay. So low stomach acid is the primary cause of acid reflux and heartburn. Now, why do we need stomach acid? Why is it so important? Well, one, it keeps the door closed, as I mentioned. Two, it um, kills bugs, AKA one major common bug that causes havoc in the stomach is H. pylori. If you ever saw at the start of this, maybe my little buddy, Australian shepherd behind me, he's waiting for his W-A-L-K. And he, I, think he can, I think he can spell now. So I have to put things in, in, in letters, but um, you should never let your dog lick your face. As cute as it is, dog stomachs are full of H. pylori. Pet them, let them lick your hand but they have very, very powerful stomachs with a lot of stomach acid, HCL, stomach acid, and it kills all bugs. We have quite a bit of it as well, but it's not as strong as dogs. So their stomach acid kills bugs, but, um, but they're always exposed to it. So there still is a lot of H. pylori in their stomach. It doesn't bother them. So H. pylori kills bugs and keeps the door closed. Okay, a little extra there on on your dog. And it also breaks down food. So HCL breaks down food in your stomach. It's the most powerful enzyme. If you can't make HCL or make the stomach acid, you can't break down food and therefore you can't absorb food. So it's necessary for digestion and absorption. So stomach acid is, is, is the most important thing, but it just has to be in the right spot in your stomach and not attacking, not, not getting exposed to your esophagus. So that's the primary cause of heartburn. Now there's four secondary causes, but there's actually a couple more I had to add in after putting this presentation together. So the four secondary causes of heartburn, AKA causes of low acid. Number one, foods. Now foods can do a lot to this. Um, proteins that cause inflammation, immune irritation. You could have a reaction to a food or a sensitivity. Um, it irritates the digestive tract, especially the upper part of the digestive tract. If you have a difficult time to digest a food and break it down, the food actually decays, it putrefies, and this adds to inflammation. 
If there's enough inflammation in the upper part of the, the intestine, it'll start off gassing. It can cause problems with this lower esophageal sphincter, this door and opening it. Um, also highly acidic foods, processed foods, sugars, preservatives, those are all very acidic foods. They, what these foods do, it's kind of interesting. When you consume these foods, they are acidic. Uh, you think that'd be a good thing because we want lots of stomach and acid in the stomach, but it's a different kind of acid. This is key. It's a different kind of acid. So when you take this stomach or these foods, a lot of them, what happens is the acid producing cells of your stomach, you have these little beautiful cells on the, on the, on the stomach lining, these acid producing cells, they produce acid. But when you add acidic food in your body, it's a different kind of acid. That's the key. You're adding a different kind of acid, but the cells don't know it. So they're like, oh, I guess we have enough acid. So they shut down. So you end up with a bunch of bad stomach, a bad acid in your stomach from these foods and not the good acid that keeps the door closed. So HCL is the only thing that keeps the door closed, not the acid from, from acidic foods as mentioned here. So we can actually, we actually end up replacing bad acid with our good acid or, or replacing our good acid with our bad acid and the door has the opportunity to open. Okay. Acidic foods, too much of it, sugars, et cetera, do this. Okay. Um, and, and as I mentioned, they downregulate and they turn off your acid producing cells of your stomach. So acid producing cells, there is a lot, but parietal cells are the kind of the biggest one for what we're going to talk about here today. There's these little cells that produce HCL. There's all these other cells, but uh, parietal cells are, are maybe some of the most important for our conversation today. Um, now, the next one after foods is stress, physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. It affects every aspect of, of your body. But what these, what these stressors do is they they reduce parasympathetics. So your nervous system is separated, uh, has a system called the autonomic nervous system. This is automatic nervous system. And the automatic nervous system is broken into two parts. One is parasympathetics and the other is sympathetics. Parasympathetics are also known as the rest and digest side of the nervous system. So when you deal with enough of, and they work on a teeter tot and the other side, sympathetics is also known as the fight or flight. So we want rest and digest to be elevated and fight or flight to be down. Because if we're in a state of physical, chemical, or emotional stress, we're in fight or flight and rest and digest gets, in he that side of the nervous system gets shut off. When rest and digest, parasympathetic side of the nervous system gets reduced or shut off, lo and behold, those little fancy acid producing cells of your stomach shut down because it's not necessary if you're in a fight or flight situation. If you're running away from a bear, you don't need acid. You don't need digestion. So fight or flight shuts down parasympathetics and shuts down the acid producing cells of your body. Again, down-regulating digestion and stomach acid production. Here's a beautiful little picture. You can see it's like a teeter-totter. One side is rest and digest and the other side is fight or flight. Okay. They work opposing. So the next secondary cause of heartburn is autoimmunity. Um, this is uh, something I work with in the office every day, autoimmunity causing all sorts of problems and, and, and then we're navigating through it. Autoimmunity with regards to what we're talking about is very specific. Um, your immune system, autoimmunity is where you, your immune system attacks yourself. Autoimmunity in this regards is when your immune system attacks the acid producing cells of your stomach, most commonly the parietal cells. And we do lab tests to find this. It's a quite common autoimmune disorder and it can be managed. Some cases of course are worse than others like anything, but you can manage it. So you can actually have targeted, your body can make targeted antibodies to attack your acid producing cells of your stomach. And if they get too many of them get damaged and destroyed, Naturally, you can't produce the stomach acid and then that whole chain of events happens and heartburn is way at the end of that, you know, way at the end of that. And again, you can't produce the, you destroy your stomach acid or your cells. You naturally can't produce uh, HCL, which is the stomach acid and, and in your also diagnosis, hypochloridria, low stomach, low HCL. 
So you can see in this, this is a picture of the stomach and it's kind of highlighted parietal cells. These are a, a target for the immune cells. And if you destroy them, again, you need a lot of stomach acid to be able to absorb iron. And if you can't absorb the iron, you can become anemic, iron deficiency anemia. And you can also become a B12 deficiency. So you need a lot of stomach acid to be able to absorb these nutrients. So nutrient absorption or lack of nutrient absorption is a big, big part of having acid reflux. Okay. And you can get anemic. It's a very common thing. I see it all the time. And then when you're anemic, exhaustion and hair loss and fatigue, and you can't heal injuries and cuts and your eyesight changes, anemia is the most important thing on a lab panel to figure out and rule out and correct. Okay. So the next, the fourth um, secondary cause of heartburn is a hiatal hernias. Now, hiatal hernia, there's a few different kinds of hernias, but this is um, a very important one. Hiatal hernias create a mechanical obstruction in the stomach uh, of the lower esophageal sphincter, the door, the door on the bottom of your esophagus, just above your stomach. Um, when this door gets disrupted with a mechanical obstruction, like a like the, the, the diaphragm, um, it'll allow stuff, you know, it opens the door and the, the acid has the opportunity to climb into the esophagus. So just another, another uh, problem. In this case, actually this case, um, this isn't really the cause of low stomach acid, hiatal hernias aren't the cause of low stomach acid. But if you look on the left, this is normal. This is supposed to be, um, that's supposed to be good. The, this is the top of the stomach here. And the diaphragm is a muscle that has a hole in it. It's like a sheet of muscle. Think of a, a plate of muscle with a hole in the plate. And it slides up and down over the esophagus without impinging on it and putting pressure. But what can happen is the stomach, and there's a couple of different ways of the, I don't know how great of a picture this is, but the stomach, yeah, this is the good on the left. This is normal. But on the right, the stomach gets pulled, a part of the stomach gets pulled above the diaphragm interfering with that little door, that, that lower esophageal sphincter. And that, and then if, if it mechanically obstructs this door, well, then the door can't close and acid climbs up. So it's more of a mechanical problem to the door on the top of your stomach. So what do you do with this? What do you do with this? Well, <clears throat> I guess I could take a step back, but what, what do you do with uh, hiatal hernias? Well, there's not necessarily, you got to rule it out. You got, and I'll talk about how to rule these things out, but it's a major cause of it. I shouldn't say it's a major. It's probably one of the lower, least common causes of acid reflux that I see in my office. It's probably way on the, on the bottom of the list, but you know, we can do a bunch of things in clinic and then people are only partially improving or not improving at all. And then we got to go to that next step. There's simple procedures for this to, to correct hiatal hernias and and it is a surgical procedure, but they, they are refined and, um, you know, they're very, very common and they work perfectly 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Now, the fifth second, <laughs> we're, we've got a, got a few more here. Fifth uh, secondary cause of, of acid, uh, of, of heartburn is H. pylori. This is that bacterium that your best friend, your dog has probably a lot in, in their stomach and in their city, killing them off because they have such great stomach acid. But H. pylori is, is a bacterium and it, it, it's very unique. It has the ability to turn off the acid producing cells of your stomach. So if there's low stomach acid, it sets up the environment so the bacteria can exist. And then if the bacteria is able to live long enough in your stomach, it shuts off the acid producing cells so it can preserve its environment and cause havoc. Uh, H. pylori was, I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> um, when was it? I think it was the eighties. I think it was the eighties. Maybe someone listening to this will know differently. I guess we can always Google it. I think it was the eighties where H. pylori was determined to be the most common cause of ulcers. So at one time we thought ulcers just exist, stomach ulcers. Mm -mm. It's H. pylori. H. pylori is the cause of most stomach ulcers. Here's a neat little picture, picture I found. <laughs> so this little green guy is H. pylori, the bacterium. He's taking a pee. <laughs> when H. pylori give off urea, because that's what they do, 
It's a waste product of H. pylori. This urea shuts off the acid-producing cells of the stomach, therefore maintaining the, the, the environment for H. pylori conti to continuously cause havoc. So, H. Pi so people are on acid reflux medication and protein pump inhibitors. And so you can see some examples here, omeprazole and, and all those other ones. They shut off stomach acid to help people get rid of symptoms. And it opens up the door to H. pylori. Okay, so don't be on acid medication and, and, and let your dog lick your face. That is going to, that's going to be a huge, huge problem or can be. So that's H. pylori and it can be taken out. Okay. Um, the next one is, um, and, and H. pylori, it does create ulcers. It creates a lot of ulcers. So, um, so there, there's lots of, um, there, there's lots of, Lots of things that that um, that can create can create ulcers, but H. pylori is a big, big, big one of them. Uh, I would say it's the most you know it's the most common, it's the most common one to um, to create to create ulcers. Um, where else are we here? Um, um, now the sixth, the sixth common cause. <laughs> This is the last one. Common causes of, of heartburn and low acid is uh, medications. Now, medications have their place, and I'm not the prescribing physician, so I'm not going to be giving advice of medications because the medical doctors know the medications the best, absolute best. Um, but it does. It is designed to shut off stomach acid um, and, and manage symptoms, and it works great. It is a lifesaver. It is a lifesaver for pain. Pain can get, you know, it can affect every aspect of life. It can get so bad. Um, they, they, they work. They work great for symptom relief. They cause long-term negative health consequences because if you shut off the stomach acid, the same things happen. The same thing happened. Very hard to get off antacids and acid medications, but don't underestimate just even over the counter, like all of the Tums and all of those things. They do the same thing. They do the same thing. And um, there's a place for them, but we got to be very, very careful with them. Now, the medical community prescribes them because um, they're trying to keep you alive. But long-term health consequences of low stomach acid, one common one, whether it's a medication or other reasons for low stomach acid, is osteoporosis, bone density problems. Because if you can't absorb your nutrients, your bone density will start to deteriorate. One of the leading causes of osteoporosis is a lack of being able to absorb nutrients. Dementia, there's a lot of research behind uh, taking antacids for your stomach and high risks of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. We don't understand all of this. I believe part of it has to do with a nutrient dysfunction, but I don't know. This is just, we just see the association. We don't know how it's caused. Um, chronic digestive disorders, naturally. Um, all sorts of them, bloating, and gas, and all those sorts of things. And nutrient deficiencies, uh, as we've talked about already. The medical community, as I mentioned, their, their, their intention is to keep you alive. That is their intention. And acid reflux, if it gets bad enough, the pain is severe. So the medication does wonders, absolute wonders. Um, but there has to be another approach than only medications. Um, once the pain is suppressed, there has to be a long-term strategy because otherwise there is no strategy. Um, but it, the medication isn't designed for health. It's designed for survival. And that's, that's what they do. And that's the purpose of the medical model, survival, not health. Um, and there's another really scary thing that they're trying to avoid with their patients is they're trying to have them avoid um, esophageal cancer. So if that stomach acid comes to the lower part of the esophagus enough, it deteriorates, it injures those cells, it mutates those cells. And if those cells get mutated enough, because the stomach acid isn't supposed to be there, right? it's supposed to be in the stomach. If, if it gets in that esophagus and mutates it enough, what happens is it, um, it, can, it can mutate the cells. And it takes a while for this to happen. If it mutates the cells enough it, and uh, it can develop into something called Barrett's esophagus, and then it can morph into what we call esophageal cancer. So it's very serious and they're trying to avoid that. So that's, that's the model 
Um, that's that's the model. So there's there's four secondary causes. So that's I guess that's the six secondary causes of heartburn. Now, what can you do for, with any kind of natural solutions to this? Well, maybe the most important thing is to you must find the cause. You've got to find the causes of this. You know, there's there's a lot of them. So where do you start? Well, you, you got to rule out things. Um, maybe the first thing you need to rule out is identify if there's a food reactivity or sensitivity. Uh, I've done a master class just on this. It would be on our YouTube channel and talking about is a food sensitivity accurate? Is it not accurate? And what are, what are the limitations and what are the expectations of a food sensitivity test? But it should be something, it's, it, it's something that I'll look at and consider with everybody um, because there's, there's a lot that, that can happen here. Um, they're, they're, the one that I recommend, if somebody is looking at all, wanting to ident identify all the foods, I recommend Cyrex Array 10. And there's right on the website, you can order directly. You don't even need a doctor, um, but just follow the recommendations on the website or give us a call because you want to make sure your food sensitivity test is accurate. And there's some prep preparatory work for it and, and even a preparatory test for it, which is really inexpensive, the preparatory test. But uh, there's a masterclass on our YouTube channel where I talk all about this, but it would be a very important thing to consider. Um, the next thing is you could try this, do a trial. It's not the easiest, but it is maybe a very smart thing to do. Avoid all acidic foods for one month. One week isn't going to be enough. Um, it, one week will almost never be enough. You got to give it a month. You got to give it a month. And rule out and address any physical, chemical, or emotional stressors. Okay. Um, there, this is a hard thing. This is a very hard thing. Where do we start with this? Well, if there's emotional issues in your life, get some help. Get some help because it could be a contributor. Remember the physical, chemical, and emotional stressors, they turn off. They've put you into that fight or flight state and your rest and digest take the back seat. And digestion shuts down. So naturally acid producing cells of your stomach shut down and then overall your stomach acid goes down and then the door opens and then acid climbs up to the esophagus. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, you got to look at all these things. It does, it does take a comprehensive approach. We can help, you know, you can always call us and look on our website. There's a mountain of information there. Um, rule out autoimmunity. Again, this is something that should be done. I talked about people having autoimmunity to the acid producing cells of their stomach. Uh, and to determine if your body is destroying your acid producing cells, you know, you can order this test. I believe it's right on our website. Um, visit the website or give us a call. We can order it for you or uh, we can order it for you. You can come and have an appointment to review it, but it should be something. It's not the first place to go, right? I'm kind of putting these in a bit of a hierarchy. Uh, and rule out hiatal hernias. Um, again, not the first place to go but it's once you kind of get through all the other. So there has to be a hierarchy of doing these things. Otherwise you can overshoot and we don't need it. So to rule out a hiatal hernia, you got to do an x-ray with a barium swallow. That's uh, the easiest, least invasive way. A lot of people in my clinic, they don't want to do a barium swallow, but if you have it, you got to know it. Um, also uh, upper esophageal studies uh, where they go in with a camera and all that uh, scopes that that that's another way to rule it out. It's a little more invasive. An x-ray with a barium swallow, you just walk in, do it. You're out in, I don't know, 30 minutes. Um, and, and you know, reach out to us or um, we can order for you or contact your primary care provider, give them the reasons why. Um, and the, another one is rule out H. pylori. Again, this isn't the first place I go. I believe the hierarchy of, of what I labeled here is the best. But there's two ways to look at H. pylori or to hunt it down. There's, there's blood tests, and then there's hydrogen breath tests. You'll see a lot of natural doctors, they like to run the hydrogen breath test. And the medical community tend, tend to only like the blood test. Uh, there's, I would say there's pros and cons of both. There's benefits to both, and then there's problems to both. A lot of times, if I'm trying to hunt down this, I'm going to do both. Um, you know, the, the hydrogen breath test, sometimes it can miss. And sometimes the blood test can miss H, you know, H pylori is sneaky. Okay. 
Um, and then there's certain symptoms associated with us, but we, you know, we can order it as well for you. Okay. And I think you can get it right off our website uh, without a doctor, I'm pretty sure. Um, rule out medications. <laughs> now, now, I'm not going to give advice about medications. And please, if you're listening to this and, and I, I'm knocking medications, I am, but don't just say, ah, I'm not taking it. It's bad for me. Uh, talk to your doctor. They know your, your system and hopefully your health uh, the best. And, um, and they know your symptoms and they know the medications. But medications, naturally, they shut off stomach acid so they can make things worse. But if you're working with your doctor, hopefully they're, they're navigating through it together and they're answering your questions. So discuss it with your primary care provider about medications and some information you're going to want to give them and they're going to ask for. They're going to want to know when was the onset of your symptom you know, exacerbation? When did, they, when did things get worse? Um, and then they're also going to ask, are there, are there any other associated variables during this time of onset? Was there new dietary changes? Was there new emotional stressors? Was there new, all of these, was there trauma? Were you lifting something and maybe you hurt yourself like hiatal hernias? So have this information for them and kind of brainstorm and think of it. If there's a change in symptoms, um, ruling out, if you are on a medication that is starting to cause a problem. So hopefully, hopefully that was, was helpful. I know there's lots there and it's not clear cut. Yeah, these comprehensive problems are not that clear cut, but start off with a hierarchy and keep working your way down. That's going to be the best. Okay. Now there's some free resources. I, I always, I always tell people and I recommend people to, um, you know, uh, visiting, visiting the website. There is so much stuff on there. There's a YouTube channel. I have over 150 how to videos. Um, that I, there is the, the masterclass on, um, on, uh, food sensitivities and are they accurate and when are they not, et cetera, and how to go about them. Uh, it's on there. Uh, there's lab testing, educational and, uh, videos and, and, and a lab store. There's also links to brainstorming with the docs podcast and you, uh, and it, an associated YouTube channel. Every week we, uh, me and my colleague, we had another, uh, video in another podcast and they're on all the platforms and Spotify and, Google podcast and Apple and whatever else they're, they're, they're all over, but there's a lot of free information there. And, and, you know, the, sometimes these symptoms like um, acid reflux and heartburn, sometimes they can be very, very serious. And maybe you've navigated through all of this already. If you haven't, I highly recommend start trying it, You can see that diagnostics play a big role in knowing and, and if it goes on too long, I, you know, I've had a lot of people inquire with their office and they've been, they've been suffering for a long time, but it hasn't got bad enough for them to want to dig their heels in. So everybody needs to be met at the right place where they are and what they want um, and what they want to do and how much work they want to put into it. So, you know, follow these strategies. Um, and, and if it's still not getting better, or maybe you've done already and you're kind of at wit's end, you reach out to us. Um, you can call us. I think you can even schedule on our, on our website. Um, let them know, let whoever you talk to uh, say that you watch this presentation and you probably qualify for a, a discount on the consultation. Um, but there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing that is maybe the most challenging with acid reflux and heartburn to overcome is if it's a hiatal hernia. But I know many people that we found it, it was a, you know, 50% contributor to their, their acid reflux symptoms. And they went in for the procedure and it was a game changer. So again, not very common, that's it, but these are everything that we see clinically that can cause this. So start chipping away through, through the, throughout the pieces. If you need our help, you know, you can reach out to us. There's a lot of information on the website. I don't want to underestimate that by any means, and it's all free. So any, with that being said, I'm Dr. Glenn Harrison. I hope you enjoyed that. I look forward to next day. I'm trying to roll out some masterclass like this every, every, um, every month. So stay tuned. And um, I look forward to uh, talking to you next time.